go through your word, go through uh, Genesis and realize, Lord, that you're good, that you're faithful, that you're just, that you're righteous, that you, you everything you do is pure in heart, Lord, and help us to get the bigger picture, Father, throughout our lives, throughout our circumstances, even now, uh, to, to look to you, Father. Use this study to encourage us uh, to see what you're doing in our lives instead of uh, looking at our own uh, circumstances and falling into our own little um, our own little world. We, we pray that you would just open up our horizon to see you and uh, do your work in and through our lives, Father, that your will would be for, performed in and through our, our, our life. And um, we just love you, Father. I pray that you would I use my mouth as your mouth and that you would use your word to impact all of our hearts, Lord, impact all of our lives, uh, that we would go and do what you called us to do, Father, to have a heart uh, that is set like your heart. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, <clears throat> as a little quick recap, you guys remember in Genesis 41, uh, so Joseph's been going through all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Got sold into slavery, he's there in prison, and God was using all that stuff to prepare him for basically the future, for what's to come. And Joseph was set free eventually, because remember, uh, the butler finally remembered him after about two years. <laughs> the butler was set free. Remember the baker who was off at this head, right? He got... got got killed, and so it was just the butler left over. He got busy back on his whatever he's doing uh, and totally forgot about Joseph, and he's there locked up. Well, he got released, and <clears throat> Pharaoh had two dreams. Nobody could interpret it, and then the butler was there, and he's like, oh, Pharaoh, I remember when you were furious with me, and he re re retold Pharaoh of everything that happened to him personally, and, and he told him, hey, there was a man who was able to interpret my dream that I had, and it came true, it came to pass three days later, you know, this is what happened. So, uh, obviously, Pharaoh releases Joseph immediately, right? Get him over here, and got him all, you know, cleaned up and everything, and Joseph comes in there, Pharaoh tells Joseph, you know, these dreams that he had, these two dreams, and Joseph interprets these dreams, but not only interprets them, uh, but so the first dream, you guys remember, involved seven years of like just feasting, right? It was just an abundance of you know food and everything. It's wonderful. But the next seven years will be seven years of famine, Joseph said to Pharaoh. <clears throat> and then after interpreting these dreams, Joseph threw in his own little wisdom or advice, right? Which is pretty practical. For all of us looking at it, we're like, well, duh, that's pretty understandable. <clears throat> all right? Very, very simple practical advice for those seven years that are going to come on as famine. Uh, prepare for those seven years with these seven years and save up the wheat and everything, all the food, so that we can sell it back to the people, right? So they're taking a percent from the people for the people. They're giving it all completely back, which our government, or no government, I have seen done the exact thing. But, uh, so it sounds very simple, you know, to, to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's, you know, it sounds amazing. Um, actually, no, 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 Pharaoh, sure, yeah, that'd be great. Pharaoh finds it, like, fascinating, so much so where he's like, put this man in charge of everything and of everyone, right? Like, second in command, boom, right? You can see the other guy who's second in command, and he's like, wait, what? He just... He just gave his own advice after, you know, the interpretation, and, but it seems like everybody was like, he's pretty wise. I mean, put away those good seven years for the bad seven years. Who would have thought of that? <laughs> Apparently, they're like, this is amazing, <laughs> you know? And so he got royalty right away. Um, but, uh, so that's called wisdom, right? There's the, you know, set, set apart the good stuff for the bad times. And if you're not doing that, we talked a little bit about that financially. It's good to put away, and biblically right here in this case, in Genesis, it's about 20% of what's coming in. If you could put away 20% for when famine comes, when those times come, that's just wisdom right there. And if you guys haven't started putting away investing, I should say, for, you know, not just spending when it comes, here, here it is, there it goes, here it is, there it goes, 
If you're living that way, what's going to happen when stuff happens, right? Are we using our heads? Are we looking forward? The Bible in Proverbs talks about, you know, putting away for not just your children, but your grandchildren, right? And I'm not talking about college, but just put away for them, you know, help them, be there for those, for others. And, uh, but how can you do that if you're not putting away for that, you know? So we talked about all that. Uh, but here in chapter 42, the famine continues to grow. Um, and remember, <clears throat> the feasting times, they, they're, they're past at this point. So we're done and over with all that. Chapter 41, verse 56, it's, it talks about that this was a worldwide famine. So the whole world had this. Um, and there's a couple of areas in the Bible where I'm like, that's probably where the dinosaurs went extinct. And that would probably be one of them, right? You know, seven years, the food is really, you know, all these animals are skinny. And they're like, you know, big animals, you know, I don't know. Anyways, so Jacob, in, he's in Canaan. He commands his kids to go to Egypt for help, basically, to buy grain, buy food. Remember at this time, Joseph, he's been elevated basically to second in command to Pharaoh over all of Egypt. So this is what's happening right now. So there's really, as we go through this chapter, there's really seven things that I saw when I was going through it. And I noticed a lot about the brothers. So what I did is I grabbed seven things about the brothers specifically. And the first is really the guilt of the brothers, and that's in verses 1 and 2. So let's go ahead and read. It says, When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? Right? There's, it was a question. <clears throat> and he said, Indeed I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. Now, you, you can see the guilt of the brothers in these two verses because, and this is kind of there, but you, you, can, you can definitely see it, because it's mentioned there is grain in Egypt twice. Jacob says that it's mentioned, right? So the brothers, they heard, go to Egypt twice they heard that. And they're standing there looking at each other, right? Like, uh, you know, they're, they're going, they're, they're saying, not, not Egypt, unbelievable, that's where we sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites, and they're headed straight to Egypt, what if we see Joseph, you know, like, the, the guilt's going to hit them like crazy, and they're, obviously, Jacob, notice in verse 1, you know, he, he, why would he ask this question unless he saw these brothers looking at each other like, oh, he said, he said Egypt, oh, well, obviously, something occurred, something <laughs> happened, and J Jacob has no clue what happened, right? And Jacob's like, why are you guys saying, <laughs> what is going on here? So uh, it's no wonder that Jacob inquires of them at the end of verse 1, you know, why are you guys looking at each other? Why are you guys, you know? In other words, what's the problem? Is there something I don't know about? <laughs> so I, I have to believe that at the mention of Egypt, the brothers when they sold Joseph into slavery, uh, begin to feel a little guilty here. And I think that that's a good thing. You, you know, when we, specifically today, when we feel guilty as believers, as the church, I think it's a great thing uh, that concerning our sin. You know, when we sin, when we feel guilty about it. What is that to us? What does the Bible say about that to us? Um, really, in John 16, 8, we know uh, it says, And when he has come... He will convict the world, in the speaking of the Holy Spirit, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So this guilt in you and I as believers concerning sin is evidence that the Holy Spirit is residing, living, abiding in you and I. So guilt's a good thing. I like guilt. Guilt's great. But once you have that feeling of conviction for your sin, righteousness, or judgment, right, when the Holy Spirit comes in you, um, I don't think that that's enough. I think we got to go on to the next step, and that is confession, right? The Bible makes it very clear in John, James 5, uh, 16. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so we need to acknowledge our shortcomings with one another, mainly to keep ourselves in that humble state more so. Right? To remind ourselves that we're not perfect, we're not, you know, keep our minds that we're not. If you guys ever got that at that point where you just don't tell anybody about, you know, you make mistakes, 
And then people acknowledge you based on, it becomes a lie now, right? Like, oh, you're so good in this era, and you achieved this, and you're like, oh, somebody else? Okay, yeah, all right, I'll take it. And all of a sudden, it just gets, it escalates. And then now, you're getting puffed up in your mind. Now you're like, whoa. And then you start to believe it, right? You believe the lie, and now you get delusional, and now you're like, I achieved all, look at all this, and then news reporters, how did you get all this? Well, I, eh. you guys, that's what I see when I hear people like that, that started off so well in ministry, and then here, it just takes a simple reporter, how did you achieve all this? And the first words, such a sad thing, have you guys heard anything like that? Where, where it could be pastors, evangelists, um, I know I have, and I'm like, <laughs> who started your ministry? Is it really yours? <laughs> is it, whose is it? It's the Lord's. Uh, but anyways, so we, we know that, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 9, or, uh, well, that, that, that doesn't say that. Um, so we'll skip to that one. But we know if we confess our sins to one another, he's faithful, he's just, and he will forgive us, right? He'll cleanse us. 1 John 1, 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 9. So I don't know how I got the other one in there. But I think not only feeling guilty... Not only um, confessing our sins, but what do you guys think is the most important thing when it comes to sin? Feeling guilty and now you're confessing it. What do you guys think would be the next thing, pop quiz, on the spot? Uh, is it repentance? Repentance. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Forgiveness, repentance. So, right? It's all, it's all about the heart. So, um, <clears throat> it's one thing to confess and it's another thing to repent of it, right? So... I think uh, that, that was the first message that Jesus brought to us. If you guys look at the Gospels, right? He's talking about repent for the kingdom of God is near. I don't have that up there, but um, it, it was the first message by Peter, right? When, when Peter says right here, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's a, if you do, then this is going to happen. This is the blessing. Um, also, it's God's will, actually, for all of us to repent. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.9, um, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it is his will that we repent of our sins, turn to him. Obviously, repentance has a free will involved in it, right? But I understand, you know, it's hard to repent uh, for all of us. If you guys are like me, it's, it's hard. It is. I understand that. And it's a temptation really to take action on our own and, and try to step in and help God and say, okay, Lord, here's, you know, the, that, that amount of repentance, you know, that needs to be done. But I know you want to take all of it, and all i got to do is really acknowledge it and give you my heart, you know, in, in that sense. Uh, and you will take that sin, and, and, and that will be done and over with, right? I'll, I'll, I choose to follow you, you keep my mind here, and I'll keep walking with you, and I'll never, you know, be distracted because I've been there, and I don't want that guilt and all that process to happen again. But the temptation is going 50% for God, 100%, by using human tactics, human uh, ideas, right? This is how you stay out of sin. You need to do this, this, that, this, this, say this, and do that, and do this, and go buy gifts for people, and go do this, or then go, then do that, blah, blah, blah. You guys, we've all heard that, right? And, and I think that's, those are good, great things, but when it comes to sin, we got to allow, and repentance, we got to allow God to do His job. He's the one who created us with specific specifics to us, right? There's details that were imputed to us uh, before the day of birth, right? And... And then there's, a, there's just a way of working things. we got to allow God to do that work in and through us. Um, I think it's hilarious that people, <clears throat> they, get, they get drunk, you know, and that's their sin. You know, they get drunk. Uh, and you can ask them, well, why, why? You know, they're like, I don't know, I, I, I hate getting drunk. You know, what, what, talk to me. Walk me through the process. Why well, would I open the refrigerator? Wait a minute. <laughs> How did you... How did it get there? Well, when I go to the store, well, then stop, but, you know, to some of us, it's simple, but sin is sin, you know, and we're all kind of the same. We all kind of fall short, period, right? No matter what the area may be. 
Uh, but the, the, the solution might be like, hey, stop doing those things, but really, or stop going down that certain road, whatever road that may be, just stop. And it, it is simple, isn't it? But you can't do it in and of yourself. Who do we need in our hearts to keep us from those things? Christ. The Lord, yeah. So if you ever thought about choosing to allow God to take your sin... Have you guys ever thought about like I'm not gonna do anything, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let let it go. I'm not gonna you know like this has been committed, and I'm I already confessed, I already felt the guilt, right? I already gave it to the Lord, um, and I'm just gonna let it go. Have we ever you know there's some people that do that, but then they because of you know want to help God out. Obviously, I, Lord, I feel bad about this, so let me go and let me go and help you in the area and show you that I'm really repentant, you know, of this area and I feel really bad about it. So I'm going to do all these things like the Hindus do and I'm going to I'm going to or like the, some of the Catholics, right? Or some people in India actually, every Passover they'll like walk on their knees, you know, all the way a couple miles to a cross. Some of them will even put nails in their hands up on a cross because I just want to show you, Lord, you know, this is I feel it and I want to show you that he already did it. He paid the penalty for our sin, you know? And we don't have to do all these crazy things. Yes, the repentance means quit, stop, turn away, turn from, right? And change of mind, change of direction. So, and we all know this, I'm not trying to drill you guys on that, but just a way of reminder. So never, never try to repent in and of your own will, your own strength, your own power. Obviously we need the Holy Spirit it's by His might, right? His power. It's by His Spirit, not our might and power. It's by the Lord who does all those things. So a good place to be in when you sin is definitely feeling guilt, definitely confessing it, definitely repenting of it. Um, but remember, you can't do anything, right? Just turn from, from it. But, and hopefully, you turn to God right at that moment. Hopefully you don't turn to any other avenues. Hopefully you just turn straight to the Lord, and that's a good thing. You turn, Lord, I need you as my Savior, right? I need you as my help. And it's hilarious to me that I'm, I'm saying these things, and some of you guys are probably like, we know this, and other people are probably thinking, that's amazing, because I always turn to the TV, or I turn to this preacher, or I turn to this pastor, or I turn to the my, you know, so-and-so person who always mentors me. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy how that works. But remember, turn straight to the Lord. You know, it's His job. So God's given us all the resources that we need to overcome sin. And the Bible is very clear. We're, we are not sufficient in and of ourselves, right? The Bible makes it clear, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also made us sufficient as ministers. So notice that. Of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, in other words, of the law, uh, but under the grace of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Obviously, you can do nothing <laughs> apart from Christ. Ephesians 6.10, finally, my brethren, be strong in who? Yourself, the Lord, and in the power of His might. Romans 8.37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors, period. Nope, more than conquerors through who? Through him who loved us. So it's all because of Christ in us. In other words, he is that ultimate resource that we have been given. He is. It's in us. He's already there. We already have the ultimate power. You know, nuclear warfare is a joke to us because we have God. You know, it's like, man. Um, but do you guys have anything to say about that? I might just be throwing out blasphemy or something. Can I read a scripture real quick? Yes. Kind of goes with you. I won't say much. Second uh, Corinthians seven ten. I'll start in uh, verse nine. Second Corinthians seven. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, "Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance. But ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. For behold, this self same thing." that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness is wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, and what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement 
desire, yea, and what zeal, yea, and what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So, I won't say too much, but I mean the the Please do. idea <laughs> that the I mean you talking you the whole time you were talking about like the Christian that has guilt, but the world has guilt. You know that's why we have religion. That's why we have yeah. you know AA, yeah. NA, mm -hmm. and every type of A out there. Yeah. You know you have everything. You have shopping anonymous. You know. <laughs> People have guilt, and it's because, you know, the law of God is written on our hearts, and we're born moral creatures. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is, is that Religions. we don't see God, we don't see our sin offending a holy God. We see our sin offending others or ourselves, and we have so much self-esteem that we think that we need to uh, work out our salvation through our own ways, which is what you're saying. Right. You know, but for the non-believer, they, they do have guilt. But God right. and sorrow leads to salvation. Meaning right. It's not profitable, yeah, it's not profitable at all. Exactly. You know, I'm sure we all see those people in our lives that, that do feel bad about things. Yeah. And may have a change of mind, but yeah. it's not directed towards the Lord. Right. It's directed towards just making themselves feel better. That's right. You know. Often, so. <clears throat> often, even we as Christians are guilty of that for sure. Absolutely. You know where, I mean, just thinking about in marriage, you know, when I'm a jerk to my husband and I feel bad about it. But do I, is it a godly sorrow that actually brings me to repentance to say, hey, love, I was a jerk. <laughs> I'm sorry that I treated you like that. I'm sorry I freaked out on you about, you know, not passing the salt cooker or right. whatever, you know. Right. But, um, but often it's not, you know. Often it is just, yeah, I feel bad, but too proud to say anything, yep. too proud to do anything about it because it's not a godly sorrow. Yeah. And that's why I threw in that verse, too, about confessing not just to the Lord, but to others for accountability's sake. And in that case, in the, in the area of marriage, you got an accountability partner, mm -hmm. you know, and, and obviously it was on to that person, right, that that wrong was made. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's good, yeah, to go to that person and not be like, oh, no, my sin was against God. Remember David with Bathsheba, he said it was against God only, so I only confess and repent to God only. And that's, you know, that's a, a wrong heart. It's good to confess our wrongs to others, right? Hey, I wronged you in this area. Or if they wrong you, hey, still good to confront it. you got to confront it. If you're a person that runs, that's not biblical. You know, I know a lot of people like that, and they got to get back on track biblically to confront things. Whether they're wronged or not, there's Matthew 18 initiative, right, that needs to happen. Or there's your part in humili humiliation in com confronting them, right, and saying, hey, I messed up. You know, here's here, here. You gotta expose, and this is a hilarious thing too. That we don't really see this, but right now, this is let's say this is our, our lifeline, right? Like how long you're gonna live on Earth, and let's just say, you know, some of you guys are gonna live short lives, like a hundred years. So we're all right here, compared to eternity, like that. Uh, compared to eternity, though, but right now, God is working something far greater in us. And I know, you know, we hear this all the time, but it really is. He really is using everything that comes around us in our marriages, in our conversations, in our trials, in our, right, the hardships, all those things that close in on us, and we're like, ah! And every word is really going to, it, it means something in eternity with Christ in heaven, right, apart from the world that we're in right now that's going to be burned up and it would be renewed, right? There's going to be, it's going to be a brand new one. But there's something there that's happening right now that is like boot camp. So when you look at things differently in that view, and that's the whole point that I see here too in this chapter that we'll get to, is everything changes, right? When someone's attacking, da -da 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 -da, God's looking and watching, and what is your words going to say? Because they're being jotted down. Every single word is being recorded. And it's going to be brought to your attention in the future. And so every situation is not just word impact, but life impact, right? And, and not just what the things you do, but the, the heart from where you did those things really matter, right? The, I believe that's going to outweigh the actions that you actually have done. So whether you had more heart here, and you never even did anything about it, but you had the heart for it, I think that's going to matter. But even if you did the thing, but your heart was way over here, because you're like, they don't deserve this. They just, you know, oh, I can't believe I'm washing their bathtub right now. Oh, right? 
Like, you know, it, the heart matters, and the heart is where it's going to be counted at that point. So it's not about the things we do. So look at things uh, that come our way, and, and we're talking about sin, take it serious, right? Like, like Kyle just mentioned, the world sees it as offending the world, right? You offended people. Look at it as offending God, then you're going to keep that, you're going to sustain that fear of God. You're going to sustain that awe of who God is. And I, I, if you guys are like me, I could just be, you know, normal. Just first thing in the morning or throughout the day, I'm just driving or whatever it is. Uh, you know, a song comes on, or even if I have the radio off, and I'm just singing to the Lord, Lord, you're so good, and I'm, I'm singing to the Lord, but I, I hear it's more about the message, and it just breaks me down, and I start to cry, because I realize I can't even sing right now, because God, you're, you're, you're too awesome for me to sing. Who am I? <laughs> I look at how good God is, and it's like, it's far out, you know, like, who are we to even be in His presence? So, it, take note, you know, on, on sin area in your life. Take note on when others are coming against you. Look, what, look at the example of, like, Joseph, like we're going through right now. Um, look at verse 3, and here's the second thing, really, that I noticed about the brothers themselves. It's really the journey of the brothers. Look at verse 3 in Genesis. Actually, can somebody read it? 3 to 5. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, Lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Mm. And remember, so Benjamin's mentioned, right? Um, remember Benjamin and Joseph are actually brothers. They're brothers of Rachel. Rachel's the one, only wife... Sons of Rachel. Sons of Rachel, thank you. What did I say? Brothers. Oh. <laughs> yes. They are sons of Rachel. And, and and Rachel's the one who Jacob loved the most. If go, everything that we know about, you know, these the, the, the other one, Leah, and the other ones, it's it's Rachel whom he loved, you know, specifically. So these are the only two sons from that wife that he loves the most, Rachel. Uh, in fact, uh, Rachel actually died giving birth to Benjamin, if you guys remember. Jacob was not about to send his only son that he thought he had to go out there on this journey, right, um, that, he, that he had with Rachel. So he's going to send them on this 258 mile, you know, from a uh, journey from Canaan down to Egypt. He's like, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. And, and notice in verse 5 that Spoon just said too, um, and the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And so this is the first time, by the way, that it's mentioned that the descendants of Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob's sons, right? The first time that it's mentioned that they actually go uh, to Egypt. They went to Egypt. And the question is, what, what got Jacob's sons to Egypt that we just read? What caused them to go to Egypt? The famine. The famine, correct. Good job. So the famine got them to Egypt. And think about it. It's a very devastating time for everybody like there's the food was hard to get to animals are just you know they're dying and they're super skinny there's not big fat cows walking around people were dying there's a lot going on this is interesting to me and this is where i stopped since chapter 46 god you guys remember god tells jacob to go to egypt for there he would make him a great nation you guys remember that and it, it, it took a famine to get jacob <coughs> his sons to actually go to Egypt. And while in Egypt they would become slaves, we know this obviously, for about 430 years. And you guys can look at that according to Galatians uh, 3. You said from chapter 46? Uh, well, we from chapter 46. We're only in 42. God, oh yeah, yeah, we'll get to that later. We'll <laughs> get, yeah, thank you. <laughs> we'll see in chapter 46. Oh. <laughs> Uh, but but no, looking at it from a, a bird's eye view, you're gonna see, you're gonna see that the nation of Israel, right? Once they're in Egypt, they become slaves, though. And I thought that was very. This is what paused me right here. Think about that. 430 years from famine to slavery, that God is birthing the church of Israel or the church, <laughs> the nation of Israel. What is happening? What's in this coffee? Why am I drinking coffee? <laughs> To, to really to make them a great nation, right? And how does he make them a great nation? By prospering them and blessing them and becoming royalty right there in Egypt and goodbye Pharaoh and they took over and 
Wow, that could have been it. No. God had different decisions in birthing Israel. Um, so it's interesting that to me, and obviously like the church, right? When God birthed the church, what happened immediately? Persecution happened, right? Obviously there's an enemy, there's counter uh, attacks that happen. So God seems to allow devastation, destruction, um, death, and all these things, right? Uh, in our lives, not to burn us out, but really to build us up, to mature us, to shape us, to form us into the image that He wants us to be in, that we would give glory unto the Lord. That's, that's His kind of glory that He wants to receive from us. We can generate that glory greater onto God by going through it with the right heart and going through it really rejoicing by seeing who God is. But you can't do that unless you really see who God is, obviously, right? you got to look to the Lord through these areas, and I know you guys are, and that's great. But God seems to allow this stuff. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10 says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. And here we see that refiner's fire, if you will. God allows that refiner's fire. And God often sends those difficult times in our lives to really mature us. Doesn't he? You guys look back at your life. I know Bethany and I were just talking about it. And she's like, I was thinking about the same thing about in different areas, but how God uses all these things in our marriage. You know, when we, before we got married, God allowed some crazy stuff to happen to us, and everybody was against us, believe it or not. Everybody, our, the people we looked up to, our friends, like everybody was against us. We were just like, where did all this come from, right? All this hardship just boom, out of nowhere. Um, and, and we're looking at all of it, and we're like, you know what? But praise God it happened, because it really helped our marriage and what it is right now. It shaped us into the people we are right now, that we're able to maturely converse with each other when things happen, and not be all immature about it, like, ah, and yell at each other, you know? Like, that's going to do anything. But we're able to communicate, and it's good, but it came about from those hardships that the Lord brought in our lives. So it's pretty interesting um, how all of that happened. But number three, let's go to the third. I don't know what's going on with that. But uh, the humiliation of the brothers. Look at, look at verse six. It says, Now Joseph was governor of the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers uh, came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Now notice, remember back in chapter 37, uh, it's actually in verse 7. Uh, when Joseph had the dream of the, the sheaves in the field, and what happened? All the other sheaves, right, you had about, uh, they, they stood up, those 11 of them, they all stood up, and then they, they bowed down to this one sheaf, who was <coughs> Joseph in the dream. And, and, and so here we're starting to see in verse 6 that, uh, I don't know what you could call it, maybe a partial fulfillment, because remember, not all the brothers are here, but it does say that they bowed down to him. And obviously Benjamin's not there, so I don't know what you would call this. But you see something happening here. So all the brothers, they're not there. So maybe it's the beginning to this fulfillment of this prophecy. I don't know what's happening. But, um, but notice in verse 6 that the brothers were not, they were not humbled, but they rather, uh, they were humbled, I guess you can say. Right? They didn't come with the humble heart. Uh, there's a big difference, too. Why did, why did they bow down to Joseph? Why do you guys think they bow down? What's happening here in verse 6? Because he's the, he's, he's the one in charge. They don't know it's Joseph. They just think it's the, you know, the Egyptian guy. Yep. So they want to bow down to them, you yep. know. Yep, positionally. Yeah, to show that, yep. you know, they're the servants, he's the master, yep. you know. Yep, and, and, and so obviously they had to bow down, right? It wasn't because they wanted to. Like, oh, that's Joseph. Let's, you know, this is something we desire to do. It's, it's out of, uh, you know, a have to. Mm. We realize if we don't humble ourselves, going back to the, the humbleness of these guys that they don't have, they, they were humbled. And, and I was reminded that if we don't humble, our, humble ourselves, God will. And what happens when God does? He does a perfect job. He destroys everything about us, doesn't he? Um, and and he, does, he does a really good job. So James chapter 4 even encourages us. In verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Don't humble yourself in the sight of man, as if that's going to do anything. 
humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And when God does, when He humbles us, He, he just, he, man, I would encourage you guys personally, from my own personal yeah. experience, humble yourself <laughs> before the Lord. Just fall on your knees and seek the Lord. In chapter 37, about the dream, the first dream, it says that my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around me and bowed down, but it yeah. didn't say 11. Um. See, now in the second dream where he had the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars yep. bowed down to me that yep. time, yep. well, the sun and the moon would be who? Right. His father and mother. mother. Yep. And then all his family bowed down when they came down. To right. Yeah, so, you see that later on. Yeah. Very interesting stuff right there, too, with Rachel when we talked about that in 37. Um, but yeah, let's look at verse uh, 7. Here's really the testing of the brothers that we start to see all the way to verse 20. Look at verse 7. It says, uh, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them, and he spoke roughly to them. Notice that. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And so Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And notice in verse 9, then Joseph remembered the dreams that were just talked about, which he had dreamed about them, and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. And we are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Ha! Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the na nakedness of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. Notice he kind of cut them off right there, right? He's like, It is like I said, You are spies. Um, and something something got Joseph, and I'm going to go over that right now. In this manner you shall be tested, but by the life of Pharaoh you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. And so we put them all together in the prison three days. Um, well, let's keep going. Then Joseph said to them, The third day, do this and live, for I fear God. I love that part. If you are honest men, notice that is something that rang in Joseph's head. Oh, you're honest men, are you? So obviously he's going to test them now. If you guys really are, like you're saying, but I know that you guys are liars, notice this. If you really are honest men and not liars, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you... Go and carry grain for the famine of your house, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Actually, yeah, let's just stop right there. So as, as the brothers are standing there before uh, Joseph there in Egypt, right? Uh, and by the way, Joseph has been, he's been there for about 20 years, right? Look at the math. Here it is. 13 years, he's been enslaved, right? He got sold into slavery. All the way up into the prison, right with the baker, with the butler, and then, and then there's the seven years of good times, right? Everything's prospering, everything's great, and then now comes the next years, and so we know he's about, he's about maybe, well, I would say probably maybe a year into it. You know, these guys are coming in, you know, probably a year later. Maybe they stored up a good amount of food. I don't know. I'm just estimating. He's around that. Definitely around 20 to 26. 38. This is somewhere around that age. Right around 38. 38? Yeah. Where'd you get that? You said he was 17, and he spent 13 years. That's 30. Well, he's been there for 20 years. Yeah, so and he got there when he was 17. If he was there 20 years, that would make him 37. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that makes, yep. Yeah. I was thinking of the whole... <laughs> How long he was in the yeah. yeah. So, so <clears throat> Joseph he's he's second to Pharaoh, right? He he's grown, he's changed physically. He's wearing maybe he's bald like the Egyptians were back then. He's probably wearing makeup like the Egyptians. Probably wearing gold stuff, the royal clothing, right? So they probably don't recognize his physical appearance. 
And, and uh, so there's a lot going on right there. Joseph spoke to them, his brothers, roughly. Did you guys catch that in verse 7? And, and, but he, didn't, he did it to test them. He didn't do it out of like spite or revenge or anything like that. But really to place, uh, to really to acknowledge their sin. He's testing them that they would acknowledge what they did wrong to him. And what I find interesting is when he questioned them, he said to them, what did he say? You guys are spies. Where did that come from, right? The brother said in verse 11, we're honest men. Oh, really? <laughs> I think J Joseph could have like, you know, he had something planned at that moment. And then all of a sudden, that was something that caught him. Oh, you're, you can see their hearts. They're still the same way. They haven't changed. They're still liars. They're still conniving thieves, basically. They, they got half right, right? No, they're not spies, but they were certainly not honest men. And this is what caught my eye. 21 years ago, they lied to Jacob, their father. You guys remember that? They, 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 and still never told the truth. They never told Jacob because Jacob, and we'll see this, Jacob still thinks that Joseph is dead. Right? They made him believe that. So they just lied to Joseph uh, uh, or, or Jacob. To jo or, no, no, no. They lied to Joseph about Joseph. He's standing right there and they're lying about him, that he's dead. Did you guys catch that? Uh, one more brother, but he's no longer, right? They said, we, we have another brother, but he's no more. In other words, he's dead. And when Joseph, he's standing right there. He's like, really? I'm dead? <laughs> Clear, clearly, they're liars. They're not honest men at all. Uh, and think about it. How can Joseph believe them about his brother Benjamin, right? They're saying, oh, and our other brother Benjamin, you know, he's, he's still there. He's back there in Canaan. How can you believe that he's still alive back in Canaan if they're lying about everything else? So he's going to give a test here, and this is what's happening. Remember, uh, Joseph and Benjamin, they're brothers, right, from Rachel and Jacob. So um, this is a huge issue for us believers that I see, since we're, we're to be honest in all that we do, right? We're not to be liars. We need to be above reproach. We, yes, make your yes, yes, make your no, no, and, and don't be anything in between, right? Just be men and women who speak the word. Uh, in fact, lying puts us in the same boat as Satan himself. Did you guys know that? John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So what makes us think that we can sin and get away with it, right? Look, look, at, the, look at these guys. They think they sin, they got away with it. What makes us think that we can sin and get away with it as the church? Do we, did you, do you know, do you guys know what I'm talking about? There's something in us that deceives ourselves into thinking, oh, I can do this, and then, you know, time's gone by. I don't need to confess it because it's not something current. Yes, you do. You need to confess all sin. You need to confess to the Lord, go back. Any unconfessed stuff, talk to the Lord about it. Um, in fact, remember in Numbers 32, okay, there's the children of Israel, and I can give you a little example here. Um, they're entering the promised land. And remember, uh, there's some tribes that didn't want to cross over. You got Reuben, Reuben, Gad, and I think it was half the tribe of Manasseh in, in Numbers 32. And, and they didn't want to cross over the Jordan, right, down the east. And so uh, they, they said, okay, you guys want to stay here? You guys don't want to cross over? Tell you guys what, if we go to battle, you guys got to come out and you guys got to help us. And they said, okay, yeah, yeah, we're going to battle out for you guys. But what happened in Numbers uh, 32, it's in verse 23, Moses said basically, But if you do not do so, then take note you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Right? We can't conceal our sin. We can't hide it. We can't get away from it. Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So, Everything is open to the Lord. He sees it all, and there's an account. Everything is being accounted for. Your words, your actions, everything. Um, and look at verse, verse. Uh, so we just read all the way to verse 20, but look at verse 18 again. Then Joseph said to them, The third day, do this and live, for I fear God. And if you are honest men, 
Let one of your brothers be confined to your, your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your house, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. But notice, remember this whole idea of testing the brothers? It wasn't done out of revenge, right? It was done out of the love that Joseph had for his brothers, which is a trip, and that desire for them to come clean. Hey guys, I got position. I can, I can bless you guys like you have never been blessed before in your entire life. And I believe he desires to do that. But they would, they, they, all they would, hey, just confess and repent of it, guys. Like, really, just come clean. Uh, but he gave them every opportunity. And I say that because just like God, you guys remember uh, God with Adam during the fall? Genesis chapter 3, after Adam had sinned, uh, God, he's in the garden, right? He's walking around and he says, what to Adam? He's like, uh, Adam, where are you? You know, and I think he, it was a question out of concern. Not, obviously, God saw where he mm. was physically, but I think spiritually, he, Adam had fall, he fell, right? He fell short of God's glory. He'd fallen into sin, and, and God says, hey, where are you? Just like he said in Revelation 3, right, to the church, uh, uh, saying, hey, where have you fallen? Get back up. Go back to your first love, right? And, and, and this is interesting, because God was using questions to give opportunity, basically, to Adam to return back to God. And for Adam to take on that, uh, just to take that, you know what I'm saying? Just, Adam, you take the, take it, just repent of it right now before I have to come in and do it. Be a man, in other words, right? And whenever I am, when she gets in trouble, I use questions to her. And so that she can confess and that she can come clean, right? I already know the answers to the questions. Do you know who did this? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, I want her to come clean and say, yes, I did it. I'm sorry. Right? But you're giving her opportunity. Oh, I'm giving her opportunity to do what was right. And that's the same thing that God does for us, right? In confessing, I want her to confess, to come out clean. I want her to repent of it. And, and, and I think that that's what Joseph's doing right here. If you guys read it, uh, and just stick to the Bible, because if you watch the movies, it gives you that twisted view, and you're like, wait, what? you got to really dilute your... The, get back in the Word, right? <laughs> dilute that worldly stuff out of there. Um, but do you guys see anything else there that's kind of... kind of stayed on that. The rest kind of flies by. Want to add anything? Nope. You good? Alright, so let's look at the fifth thing. Here's the confession of the brothers. Look at verse 21. It says, Then they said to one another... We are truly guilty concerning our brother, and, and I agree, that's what, like what Kyle said, the world feels guilt as well. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear, therefore this distress has come upon us. And, and Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. In other words, he was speaking the Egyptian language. And he turned himself uh, away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them, and he, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Now, back in verse 21, here's this 21 years of sorrow, right, and guilt that has been built up in their hearts. Here that they, they 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 confessed it and they bring it to light finally, right? It's been it's been a burden basically for them. And here's a lesson for all of us. I think yes, I think um, it's important that we get things right with God, but others as well, right? When we treat others wrong, we need to be quick to go and make things right with others. And that's a great thing. Confess what we've done. But look at verse 23. Remember Simeon and Reuben. They're actually, they're brothers, right? It was Reuben that said, don't harm the boy. And also, if you guys remember, recount the time. Remember, they're throwing Joseph down into the cave. And he's like, no, don't, don't kill him, you know, don't harm him. And they saw the, the Ishmaelites coming, the slave traders. And then Reuben jumps in, right? And he's, he's trying to save him, Joseph. And so he's standing up for Joseph. So could it be that Reuben was talking to Simeon specifically? He was looking at Simeon maybe at this point in front of Joseph uh, during this conversation. And, and the last one maybe back then before he even sold Joseph off. 
Maybe he was looking at Simeon that was, uh, you know, putting all this stuff forward. Maybe I'm throwing that out there. The Bible doesn't say anything about it. But, um, and that might be the reason why Joseph takes Simeon specifically to jail. And everyone else gets to go back to Canaan. That's what's happening right here. And look at the, here's the fear of the brothers that starts to begin. Look at verse 25. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. Notice he, thus he blessed them basically, right? He returned good for evil. And, and, and so they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feet at the encampment, he saw his money. And there it was in the mouth of his sack. And so he said to his brothers, My money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. And then their hearts failed them. And they were afraid, saying to one another, What is this that... Oh, guess who the blame's going to? God. What has God done to us? Did you guys catch that? Joseph not only gave them their grain, but he gave them their money back, right? Why did Joseph do this? It was to bless them. It was to minister to them. But they were so filled with guilt in their hearts. Why? That they, they saw that it was God giving, what, retribution, basically, back onto them. Hey, you guys did wrong, I'm going to do wrong back onto you. That was their idea, and they're like, oh, God, what are you, oh, you're doing it to us. Obviously, they know God saw what happened. And so, in verse 28, look at the end of verse 28. It says, what is this that God has done to us? So, obviously, they thought God's punishing them. Um, and, and, and I do agree, yes, there is penalty for your sin, Right? There, there is punishment for your sin, uh, but I don't see that here. Uh, we have the tendency of looking at God like He's you know, always punishing people. And, and some people come to salvation in the eyes of the law. And, and they're under you know, the God of law only. They're, they come into this impression that God is just going to... He's just just, and that's it. And that's final. They don't see the grace in the Lord or that love. But you know, it's kind of like... Bethany and I, we love our kids, right? And that's why we punish our kids, because we love them, right? It's our desire to restore them back to that relationship with us, and that's why we punish them. That's why we do those things, to give them basically hope, to talk to them, say, hey, we don't want you to be like other kids. We want you to be, you know, walking in the eyes of God. We want you to be pleasing in God's eyes, to cause them to realize that, you know, what, whatever wrong that they did, they need to repent of that, turn back and walk right, right? To help them restore that relationship that they lost, right? To love them. And that's exactly what God does to us, right, as the church. And this is what, what the Lord's doing. So many people, they come to God through the law, uh, and they forget about the God of love, right? And that's what we got to recognize. God is all about love. So it's all about grace. And, and we need to understand this. The law says... Don't do this, but the love says what? Love says, hey, you don't have to do that. In other words, love gives a choice. The law says, you know, it's more condemning and don't do without a choice. It's like you have no other choice. You only do right and that's it. But love says, hey, you don't have to. You don't want to. You don't, you know, look, look, you got options. And so, very interesting. Look at verse 29. Here's, here's really the rebuke that we start to see here of the brothers. In verse, uh, let's just finish it. Verse 29 all the way to 38. Um, it says in verse 29, Then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is lord over the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We're honest men. Jacob, we're really, we're honest, we're not liars, we're not spies, we are, we're twelve brothers, sons of our father, one is no more, and the youngest is with our father, this day in the land of Canaan, then the man, the lord of the country, said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men, leave one of, and notice that's the whole point of this whole test, whether they're honest, he could care less about anything else that they're saying, he's saying, oh really, he's trying to prove a point here to them, you're not honest. So he says, leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the family of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they had 
or when they and their father saw the bundles of the money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. Right? We counted him as dead already. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Notice that. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Oh, this is hilarious. Actually, let's just pause right there in verse 36. So, uh, Jacob feels all these things are against him. Notice he's taking it all personally. And I can understand what Jacob's going through here, right? He's thinking, you know, my son Joseph's dead. Simeon's probably going to be dead. We're not going to go back for him. and He's going to die. And he's losing everything. Sometimes we, when we see in our own eyes that we're losing everything or that everything is going wrong, but in God's eyes, everything is going right. Everything is happening and coming into play. And I think that's interesting that we don't think about that, do we? When everything seems to be happening bad around us, and if you haven't experienced that, you will. <laughs> Time could only tell. I think, I think we could all raise our hands and say that you know, everything has collided on us at one moment in our lives. Um, but... It's not about looking at the present circumstances, and that's what Jacob's doing right here, obviously, right? He's looking at the present circumstance, and sometimes we feel the same way, that everything is falling against us, everything and everyone is coming against us, and, and it, but really, in re reality, everything is working for us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, Paul says, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. I've been chewing on that verse for a long time now. That's where I get all of this from. When we realize God is working in and through us for good, guess what? We'll stop putting things into this. Look, oh, this just happened to me. That's category bad. That's category, category good. Guess what? When you start to understand that everything that God is doing in you is good, you start to place everything, not in good or bad, but in God. Right? That's category God. Whether it's good or bad, oh, it's all from God, right? And look, notice in verse 37, Then Reuben, and this is hilarious, right? Here's the humor that the Bible has. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, Okay, now notice, let me give you a little recap. Jacob is feeling bad that he lost his children, right? He's feeling sorrowful. He's probably crying at this moment. And here comes Reuben to save the day. Father, kill my two sons! <laughs> kill your grandchildren! Saying, uh, if I do not bring them back to you, this reminds me of Peter, right? Peter jumps to save the day. <laughs> you want us to call down hellfire and brimstone like James and John said to Jesus to you, right? But, but put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. What in the world is he thinking? <laughs> I read this and I was like, really, Reuben, kill your two sons? Do you really think Jacob's going to kill his grandchildren? <laughs> He didn't come back. Where's his grandchildren? Where's my grandchildren? I love them so much, but they're, you're dead. That's not going to happen. Um, Jacob wouldn't actually do that. So I don't know what this guy's thinking. Labor 38. Anyways. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead. So he didn't even, he didn't even, he didn't even look at Reuben right here, right? Uh, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him among, along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, Jacob had placed great importance on the things that are temporal, okay? People and things, they're going to pass away, right? Like, obviously, we just talked about, right? So there's, there's people passing away. This week alone, there's people passing away. Um, and believe it or not, there's probably going to be more people, somebody in our life, right, that can happen. We don't know what God's will is as far as when He wants us all gone, right? We can't see those things. But things and people are going to be gone, right? Ecclesiastes talks about it. Everything's for a season. Everything happens for a time. Everything, you know, it's Ephesians 1.11 says, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him, who works all things, and notice he work, God works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his will and his purpose, right? Romans 8.31, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who really could be against us? For real, 
The, so the eternal is what is important, right? People, things, you're going to pass away. Don't let those things get you all like, oh, the end of the world, right? I was just talking to Bethany. What would happen if our house burned down? She's like, I don't care. I was all, me either. <laughs> but where would we stay? <laughs> That's another question, right? Hey, move it in. to me in the parking lot. But so remember those things, right? The, the, these things are... They're all happening around us, and life just goes on, right? And it will. But God is going to use these things around us as He's going to heat it up, he's, as a refiner's fire, right? He's going to mature us and perfect us, and that's what, what He's doing. Obviously, with Joseph, we know the end result, right? With Israel and what He's doing. We see Israel today, which is a trip, right? Reading this, this story. There's a lot of people that read Genesis in the past, and they didn't see the nation of Israel for a time. Right? But we get to see the nation of Israel. We get to see the end result of a lot of stuff that's going to be happening soon. And so it's, it's just interesting to, to look at all this. So, um, you guys got any questions? Anything you want to add to? I got a little excited on it. Damn. I just took it. Ball hog. Just grabbed it. And then, nope, nothing's good. It's like, uh, uh his first coming, they don't recognize him, but they'll recognize him in the second coming. Ah, nice. So that's a little bit of next thing. Another one too, yeah. yeah. There's so much pictures of Jesus through the life of Joseph. And the Amazing. Only, the only reason, the only way they can truly get fed in the time of a famine, and the only time it's okay to go to Egypt is when you have a Christ-like figure, right. Joseph. Well, not necessarily ruling, but like, right. kind of in control. And that's the only time we see Egypt, by the way, too, is mm -hmm. not... Yes, Egypt's always a picture of the world, uh, but at this point, it's not a negative connotation, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's, it's more of a good thing. They don't see it right now. We don't see it right now. But we'll start to see that as we go through and what's, what's, what's going to be happening. So, interesting. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and your word. I know it's so much, Lord, and uh, such great reminders, Lord, uh, for all of us uh, just to realize the, the seriousness of sin, to realize the seriousness of your presence in our lives, Lord, that we chose to accept you, Lord, and, and to believe in you and to put our faith in you, and you changed us, you transformed us, you you molded us into that your image, Lord, you're continuing that work in us and through us. And um, Lord, help us not to be surprised when these things happen. Lord, help us to, like James says, Lord, not, not to be shocked, Lord, but just recognize these things are going to happen. And so help us to keep guard. Uh, help us to keep our minds focused, our hearts focused, Lord, our, our actions focused and Christ-like in all that we do. And uh, we love you, Father, and that's why we want to do what we do in giving ourselves up, Lord, and surrendering to you. To You would uh, use us whatever way you would want us to be used. And so uh, we place our hands and our lives and our, everything that we do uh, in your trust, Lord, because we know you're good. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.